What up, Seth Miranda here. This is Adorama Rewind, and this is the last rewind I'm gonna be doing from home base here at Adorama. For a couple of weeks, we are off to Europe. Gonna hit up Amsterdam for IBC to report what's going on over there, and head over to London to see what's going on in London. Uh, come back with a bunch of shots and some videos and content for you, so stay up on Adorama TV for that. Plus, hit me up on Instagram so you can stay up to date live. I'll be posting a lot of story modes, of what's going on, what we're doing, and what we see over there, so. Uh, keep up with me there. Now, um, sorry, I just dropped the momentum because with a heavy heart, we're gonna kick this week off with Peter Lindbergh, fashion I photography icon, has passed away at 74 years old. Uh, Peter Lindbergh, without a doubt, is a huge heavyweight in the fashion photography industry. Uh, definitely almost every other image you've probably seen that has been acclaimed came from Peter Lindbergh. He definitely saw things um, for the real beauty that is sitting there and how to really use his photography to not only capture it, but really lock you into it. Uh, he's kind of famous for the era of the supermodel, meaning that he shot you know, Naomi Campbell and women like that, which transcended beyond just being a model that wore something in a photo, but became a persona themselves and was inducted into mainstream society. But uh, what I want you guys to see is, first of all, this is his Instagram, doing the cover of Vogue, Harper Bazaar, all sorts of stuff. But these are the images you probably really remember, this kind of stuff right here, the 90s, the really amazing, just genuine, very real, no retouch, just this is who's in front of my lens type imagery. Um, I strongly urge you to check out his Instagram. If you're someone who's younger and should is trying to find who's out there to really follow, these are the real influencers. These are the people that really paved the way before people were doing things to emulate, you know? So he saw things his way and people agreed and became successful at showing his images and being hired to document fashion designers lines and the pages and the publications and all that other stuff. But what I wanted to really pull up here was some of his quotes really quick. I know I'm hanging on this, but I think it's very rare we get a chance to talk about uh, people of this caliber in this industry right now. So he says, as a fashion photographer, you should contribute to defining the image of the contemporary woman or man in their time to reflect a certain social or human reality. How surrealistic is today's commercial agenda to retouch all signs of life and of experience to retouch the very personal truth of the face itself. This should be the responsibility of photographers today to free women and finally everyone from the terror of youth and perfection. What he's basically saying is there's a beauty right in front of us. There's no need to rip away the reality to make something that doesn't exist seem beautiful for people to buy into. And I can't commend this enough. You, we've seen uh, plenty of episodes of Rewind where I just go off about how I really want to get back to the actual documentation of photography and not these like ripped away pores and no blood cells inside human beings. And Peter Lindbergh really saw realistic beauty. I hate saying it like that because it seems like it's a given, but it isn't these days. So if you're someone that's coming up right now, these are the people you should be looking at. And Peter Lindbergh definitely created this level of imagery that will be a legacy forever. There's, his images will never die, and that's what we should all hope to achieve as photographers is this level of our immortality through the images we create. You know, fashion photography itself is very expendable as far as uh, what they shoot today is out of season or out of style in like a month or two and then you move forward. But his images have obviously transcended beyond just the fashion itself. But these time capsules and also being timeless, it's, it's like both sides of it. I, I really uh, was influenced by Peter Lindbergh. I know Daniel definitely was for sure. You could see that on his 200th episode. He uh, did a, an homage to a lot of the guys who shot supermodels and stuff like that. Uh, but... You know, when I was coming up, there was no social media to have a community. You were very solitary and silo when you were trying to learn this craft and try to find your own style, your own point of view, your own vision and build your skill set. And you'd have to go and find these guys to try to communicate with them to maybe assist. Maybe you heard them speak somewhere. Maybe you read an article where it was like a little snippet of something they said. But now we're so communal. Like, look at what we're doing right now. I'm basically talking right to you and you're going to talk right back to me in the comments somehow. And that's so uh, valuable that we just didn't have. So these are the photographers we sought out. We just wanted to see what was in their skull that they were thinking about to get to the level they were at and achieve the looks they were getting and see the, how they built their point of views. And I think that um, we can get back to that. 
So when we talk about influencers, we, we what, two, um, two episodes ago, we talked about a girl that might have faked a uh, motorcycle accident and her whole Instagram is just her laughing. We call that an influencer. No, this is an influencer. This is a guy who blazed a craft and a style and a level to reach for guys like me and other people in probably my generation. And I hope that younger photographers now can get through all the Instagram-y popular people and find this level of work and photographer and just person, all right? Uh, sorry to start off on that note, but speaking of like legit influencers, let's talk about this uplifting story. Country star Casey Musgraves, or however you say it, uh, went to find a one hour photo to develop some film, and she found a mom and pop store called Tom's One Hour Photo in Koreatown in LA. And she heard their story that they were struggling, and boom, she did a bunch of Instagram and Twitter posts with her collective following of like a couple million people to say, like, hey, you should check out this place, it's great. And this store had no social media presence of its own. And overnight they built a 59,000 uh, following right there on Instagram just off of this. That's a legit influence. So that's someone that's actually going like, hey, this is something you should check out, not, hey, here's a fake life you should emulate. So I gotta give a lot of props to Casey over here. Uh, and it's really cool to see um, Analog having a little bit more traction these days. Uh, uh, film has been selling more and more every week. Uh, here in Adorama, I'm watching we walk out with bricks of uh, rolls of film. So I hope that we can keep some of this mom and pop stuff alive. The, I actually worked at two one hour photos in my life. And one of them was during 9-11 here in New York where I was developing uh, disposable cameras for all the fire department. They was dropping garbage bags full of them and I was getting a first hand view of 9-11 at that time. And I'll never forget that. And just holding the prints instead of flipping past them is something that I, I could still feel the prints in my hands. Like I know that seems a little deep, but I'm a hardcore New Yorker and that was a hardcore time. And I really hope that uh, stores like Tom's One Hour Photo can still exist in this digital world. So nice job, Casey. Uh, however, in the more Instagram-y type news, Disney is shutting down the Nat Geo Your Shot website. Uh, yeah, so, you know, they bought up National Geographic, and now when you go there, you'll get this message, which says, as of October 31st, Halloween, your shot platform will be discontinued, and all engagement signs and promotion of photos from our community will occur in National Geographic's Instagram Your Shot feed. So they built a little community for people in the Nat Geo world for them to share their work and get feedback from experts and peers. And now they're saying mm, that's gone as of Halloween this year, 2019, and you're gonna be seeing everything on Instagram. I don't know what to say about that. Uh, you know, it's hard to have a million platforms that people engage on all of them. They only have so much time, ambition, and energy in the day to spread ourselves across them to share work. So kind of smart but also I'm sure people that were building something just in that one community is feeling the hurt on this one. So I hear you. Let me know what you think about that down below. Are you someone that was in the Your Shot community? I wanna hear from you. I don't know anybody that was in there, so I'm kinda of curious if it was like a really uh, robust community system there. As the air conditioning kicks on, let's talk about some gear news, okay? So Canon introduces a C500 Mark II Cinema. So this is a modular system. It's a 5.9K full frame sensor that can also do Super 35, Super 16 millimeter crop modes. It has an interchangeable lens mount, which is great because if you have a lot of favorite glass, you can just adapt it right to this body. The new Digic D7 processor, Canon Roll Light, XF AVC recording codex, uh, Canalog 2 and 3. Uh, but the interchangeable lens mount is really what's pretty cool about this and the, uh, the uh, modular system. So this is what the core body looks like. And then you can build it out with EVFs, LCD screens, you know, more ports for audio. Uh, you can have ethernet connectability for multiple cameras or, uh, you know, there's, I did a really short video on the spec sheet on Adorama TV. Uh, you can check that out on the channel, but one of the other cool things about it is it uses the newest memory. So CF Express has finally been announced by SanDisk, and we are looking at read speeds of 1700 megabytes per second, 1400 megabytes per second write speed, up to 512 gigabytes so far. Um, it's pretty fast, so anything with XQD right now is the same physical interface, and now there should be a firmware update for almost all devices. I know Nikon has it, um, Panasonic, uh, you can still use your XQD cards, but now you can also use the CF Express, which goes from 64 gigabytes to 100, 512 gigabytes. But yeah, that's a heavy price tag of um, 150 to, to $600 per card. And the reason that is all new memory 
starts off high price because there isn't a lot of availability, there aren't a lot of people making it, there aren't a lot of devices that use it, but the more common it becomes, the cheaper it gets. I mean, SD memory is like free now. You know, it's like twenty dollars for one hundred twenty-eight gigs. Years ago, it was like a dollar a gig. I mean, that's really what it was. So, as this go, we go forward with the technology, more resolution, more information on the uh, files. We're looking at two hundred and fifty megabyte raw files coming out of SLR cameras in our hands right now. So it's only gonna get bigger and more in depth. Even if it's not about the resolution, the dynamic range that's in there, the hidden information you don't see off the bat, but the flexibility in the files makes them larger and larger. The, the color depth, right? 10-bit color for video, monster files, 12-bit color, ProRes RAW we're gonna see soon. So we, we're gonna have to let go of some of the older memory. We, it took a, for a long time for compact flash to go away and it's kind of still hanging in there a little bit, but it's basically gone. SD memory held in there the longest. They are trying to innovate SD memory to be bigger in capacity and faster in speed and act even like physically tougher. But in the end, you're just making that memory more and more expensive. And then the newer memory, which could probably expand beyond what SD can do will be kind of the equivalency. So look into that if you're someone that's in the Nikon Z series, the Panasonic S series, any of the Sony camcorders that take XQD. Uh, there's a few devices out there that do it. Uh, speaking of Nikon with uh, CF Express and the Z, they did announce that they're on the horizon for the D6, which is their flagship series. So the D series has been the top of dog in the Nikon series. They're, they are mirrored optical DSLRs. There is no idea of pricing, specs, nothing. Yeah, they're saying it's like 30 something megapixels at a billion frames per second. It might have a stabilized sensor. These are all speculations. Nobody knows anything for sure. They're saying it is the most innovative uh, or I don't know, like the most advanced DSLR to date. People are gonna argue, well, do we still need DSLRs? Are we moving towards mirrorless? Maybe we are, maybe we aren't right now. Mirrorless has come a long way, and yeah, it's totally usable now, but for a long time it wasn't. Cameras were overheating, uh, you, you had blackout in the EVF, you had EVFs that were just so low res we couldn't deal with it. Uh, the processor just couldn't handle what performance a DSLR could provide. Uh, the autofocus systems, and we're getting there, right? Like, we're seeing good autofocus systems, we're seeing file transfer output, and that's great. But what we're looking for in these type of bodies is durability, like hardcore, tanks that I, you know, you can shoot in any conditions, weather sealed, mud flying around, shooting at the Olympics, slamming it down, grabbing your next piece of gear. And that's what pros really gravitate to. And that's why when you watch something like the Olympics, you still see a lot of DSLRs out there on the line because they've been reliable. You know, innovations and spec sheets and features are great, but the, if you're not 100% trusting of your gear yet, or it hasn't been out there in the field long enough to see where, it, where its uh, limits are, you know, it's hard for someone to rest their entire career on it, right? So peace of mind goes a long way with photographers. And I'm curious to see what this is about. I'm also curious to know, is the D6 just where they're gonna take it? Or are we gonna see something like a Z9, like a Z series flagship? Are we gonna get that next year? I don't know, man, everyone's all over the place, but I'll tell you this, 2020 is gonna be a pretty interesting year. Uh, however, Nikon did quietly release the Nikon Z 24 millimeter F 1.8 S series. So it's a very small, very light 24 millimeter for the Z series. We're looking at about a grand, you know, all the typical stuff, nice bokeh, low light versatility, edge to edge brightness and sharpness, you know, all that stuff, low chromatic aberration. Uh, we'll see how this thing performs when you get it in our hands, but now they have a pretty decent uh, lineup for native lenses for the Z series or the S line as they're calling it. I don't know how many letters and numbers I can take in this industry anymore. Um, let's talk about Kodak for a second because they threw their name on a bunch of stuff for smartphones. They teamed up with iCarumba and they're making a bunch of stuff like clip-on lenses, tripods, iPhone cases. Um, I don't think it's genuinely Kodak. It seems like it's branded Kodak. So iCarumba, this company probably went to Kodak and said, hey, we made all this stuff. Would you like to put your name on it? And Kodak was like, yeah, that sounds modern. We'll do that. Uh, is this kind of desperate by Kodak? I don't know, Kodak was such a legacy company. It's kind of heartbreaking to see um, them flailing around a little bit. They're one of these companies that I think in some form or another, whether it's a grand scale or just smaller, they'll always exist, but how they exist is another story. So I don't know. Uh, let's talk about some really, really techy innovation stuff. So 
We've been dealing with USB-C inside our MacBooks and all these other uh, devices lately. Well, USB-C is basically Thunderbolt kind of more or less, right? It's 3.0 Thunderbolt, and that's been 10 gigabytes per second on the top end. USB 4 has officially been announced at 40 gigabytes per second power and display port uh, capability, which is basically an all-in-one um, uh, plug. There it is, the USB-C that we all know and sort of love. I know people that have the MacBook Pros are all like carrying out a thousand dongles and docks to adapt everything they have. At least we're sticking to the same physical port, which means that going forward, maybe we'll see everything have just the similar USB-C, which is cool because USB-A was too big to put directly into cameras. USB mini lasted like for like five minutes. USB micro exists out there and is mainly for power more than uh, data transfer. And you see it in smartphones like that. But USB-C seems to be like a middle ground physically and astronomical technically. So 40 gigabytes a second through a cable is pretty awesome. And um, I'm curious to see if that's what goes into the fabled MacBook 16 inch that they're working on but somebody is kind of putting Mac against the wall. Azus is unveiling this Pro Art Studio Book. This thing is a monster. So first they announced this new 1600 nit Pro Art display that they're talking about right here, and that's supposed to go against Apple Pro Display XDR, but this thing has the Quadro RTX 6000 Pro graphic card, which just one of those cards is $4,000. So I have no idea how much this laptop is going to be at point of sale, but it is crazy powered for graphics. It's clear that Asus is going for the creative market. They want to be there for content creators. We're just so fixated on iOS and OS Mac systems for Adobe, for Capture One, for all every. I mean, the entire industry for publication has been Mac forever, basically, right? There's a few exceptions, definitely. Uh, but as far as PCs go, this seems like a humongous swing at Apple. Uh, but will the price point affect how popular it gets? That's kind of the question, right? So um, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Keeping in with sciency news, I wanted to pull this one up. Scientists took the first pictures of a black hole are being awarded $3 million. So this is pretty cool. Uh, what's really cool is how they did it. So if you watch this three minute video that's in this link, they talk about what it took to actually achieve this image of a black hole. And what it, they're basically saying is, let me speed it up to about here-ish. What they're saying is that they had to basically put telescopes all over the world and make a planet sized telescope to document it, which is crazy. If you watch this video, they're going into it in depth and it's three minutes, so for all you, people out there that have three minutes to spare, just do it because it's kind of crazy to see what uh, we as a species achieve there. And this just means that we're gonna get closer to maybe videos of a black hole and really discovering, not, not actually not just discovering, but physically seeing things that science has been taking, that have been talking about forever. Sorry, trying to do this all in one take. Let's try that line again. We're finally gonna be actually seeing what scientists have been talking about forever, right? We just speculate and try to envision what's up there, but now we can actually see it for real. We uh, saw the image of the sun that we had on Rewind a couple weeks ago, and now we have a black hole. That's pretty bananas. And I'm gonna scale it all the way back down from a worldwide telescope to the wearable cinematic light that's coming out from Spiffy. So this is what it looks like. It's a little light bracelet, and you're gonna say, what? Raver kids have been doing this for years. Uh, true, but this thing actually, look at this, 95 plus CRI, which you know you can take with a grain of salt because CRI is whatever. Uh, color temperature adjustable from 2700K to 6500K, splash proof, uh, and it's small and portable. So what they're saying is that for about 45 bucks, you have a bracelet that while you're on set, you can have a true color light, a, wor a light to work with, or a light to actually work with, meaning I could wear it and actually be on set when it's dark and have a, a work light, as well as using it as a practical, meaning I can do a long shutter exposure and drag it and do whatever else I want, or maybe have a quick video light at all times with me. That's kind of cool, 45 bucks, low investment. I think I'm just gonna grab one just to see what it's up. Maybe I'll do a demo here for you guys on uh, Adorama's IG Live. We'll see what happens. Spiffy has made some pretty cool stuff. Um, it's always 
super creative and very fun, whatever Spiffy puts out there. And I know that Gavin Hoey, our main host here on uh, Adorama TV, uh, definitely likes the, the guys at Spiffy and what they put out there. Uh, I'm going to cap out the articles with this one, which I think is pretty interesting. Going along with that D6 we were just talking about, uh, when I kept saying that you see more and more DSLRs at, on the sidelines of the Olympics, stuff like that, this was an interesting topic. So if Lagerfer says, what the Sony A92 needs to take gold to the 2020 Olympics, they're basically saying what I just got into, saying that they need to have the build quality and the trust of the pros to know that they can slam it around and get it. And there's the D6. So it's a pretty good article if you're in the Sony system. The A9 is incredible. They, they really pushed the limit of tech on that one. And this was already a couple of years old, the A9, right? So we're all awaiting either the A9 II or the A7S III and all these other like letters and numbers. And they're going to keep going and going and going. But it has to be adapted and accepted by pros and community for it to fly. And they, didn't, they thought the A9 was going to be like the all sports killer. And we didn't see so many of them out there. It didn't really take off the way that they thought. Uh, was it the price point? Was it that Sony's alpha system was too young for a lot of people to be into it? I, I can't answer that. But what I can say is that the A9 II, if they make adjustments to it, could be seen more and more readily available out there. So uh, read this article, check it out. I'm curious, I think it's, we're really lucky as photographers right now to, my phone's going off here. Uh, I think we're lucky as photographers right now that you can really throw a rock at anything in a camera store and it's just amazing equipment. Like, like it's just crazy what we're making out with. Uh, and I'm going to clue you guys into some stuff on Adorama's channel. So if you are an audio fiend and you haven't uh, seen it, we have Perfecting Audio with Keith Alexander, which is one of the most legit guys ever in audio. And he, this is uh, how to uh, record on the fly. And he goes through everything with you. And by the way, he has one of the most soothing voices ever. So I'm going to put that link down below and you can check that out. I'm having some internet issues here. Here we go. So you can see that he's just going through what you need to do to record in a busy convention center, what type of mics to use, how to place them, how to you know, calibrate and go forward. And uh, it's pretty awesome. I will say that he is probably like the man in audio. If you are at all having trouble with that in your game, and I think a lot of people who do video often put audio on the back burner and that's kind of the way not to do it. Uh, in this world, you can have bad video, but good audio and people will watch you. you have, uh, bad audio and good video, people flip past it. So uh, check out Keith Alexander, great guy, super knowledgeable, uh, and it's an awesome series. Just, just binge watch it, just do it. And finally, I'm gonna clue you into something that I think everybody, if you're an Adorama uh, fan, check out the Twitch channel. I know I keep on talking about it, but look, trivia. Uh, I'm doing trivia for gift codes. So here in the chat, you can see people are answering all these uh, trivia questions. And they're winning, you know, 10, 15 bucks at a clip to, uh, to Adorama.com. So come join us on Sundays, 12 to 3 Eastern Standard Time. And there's player takeovers during the week if you're a gamer and want to check out specific games. Josh doing Apex, uh, uh, Trisha doing Brawlhalla. Sometimes I jump on there for Mortal Kombat. Pixie Peachy rocking all the RPGs out there. So... Hit up the Twitch channel if you're into gaming. And uh, also, we now carry consoles here at Adoram, which is awesome. So I've been picking up a lot of Nintendo Switch stuff here, which is pretty great. Okay, that's where I'm going to leave it. That was a lot. It was like ups and downs. What a roller coaster. We took a journey together. Uh, thank you for being with me. I'm going to leave you with the question of the week, though. And in total respect to Peter Lindbergh, I want to know who is an icon to you in this industry. If you're a photographer, who's an icon? If you're a videographer, who's a filmmaker, who out there, or audio, who's an engineer for you? Who out there is an icon for you in the craft you do? So hit me down below in the comments, tell me one, what discipline you're in, is it audio, visual, what is it? Uh, and who out there not just influenced you, but you feel is like on a pedestal that has a legacy that'll transcend beyond time itself. That's pretty heavy. You know, just someone that you really admire, really respect, and think that regardless of what type of photography or video you do, you can't help but respect their, their, uh, their methodology and the work they produced. 
All right, guys, thank you so much. Uh, next time I see you, we'll probably be on location in Europe. Uh, if something goes wrong there and I can't get it out there, I'll, I'll, I'll figure something out. But I will see you guys soon. And uh, listen, be good to each other. And just remember, influencers are only influencers if they influenced you. So if you want to carve your own point of view, you want to carve your own path and style, just be yourself. That's all you can be is yourself. All right, guys, peace. Oh, wait a second. I can't do that. I'm supposed to say, write me a comment, hit like, share this video around, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell so you don't miss anything. Now I can go. All right, peace. Oh, and for anybody wondering on the Twitch channel, the dinosaur hatched, and this is what it looks like. I don't know. It's overexposing probably, but this is the dinosaur.